Many wonder about the situation inside China as more countries put pressure on Beijing. Videos surfacing show soldiers in local markets in China's northernmost province. As speculation flies around the health of North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un, Chinese citizens reporting activity at the border. In an open letter, a critically ill mother expressed her wish to see her son, who was jailed for exposing human rights abuses. Canada's opposition leader recently said the country needs to rethink their relationship with China. How are Canada-China relations and what's the significance during the pandemic? And the U.S. intelligence community weighing in on the origin of the virus, saying it's not man-made or genetically modified. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now to China's border with North Korea. There's been speculation about the health of the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un recently. Some say he's critically ill. China may be preparing to guard its border in case North Korea becomes unstable. Two videos show tanks and other military equipment being transported to the border area. The convoy is several miles long. A local resident told Radio Free Asia the border areas on the Chinese side were all blocked. All trains to one Chinese border city are suspended and nobody is allowed to enter. She added there's a rumor that over 3,000 people in North Korea are infected with the CCP virus, but she can't know for sure. And in another province, Jiangsu, hundreds of miles away from the North Korean border, an April 27th video shows at least nine military trucks transporting weapons. It's not clear if it's related to the activity at the border. The outbreak in China's most northern province, Heilongjiang, seems to be worsening. In its capital, Harbin, soldiers appeared at a market. The person taking the video says, look what our Cao Shijie market is becoming. Soldiers, city management, traffic police, my goodness, they are all here. Another video shows an ambulance on the street with workers dressed in protective suits. NTD obtained the minutes of an April 19th meeting of the leading group for combating the epidemic in Heilongjiang province. The document says certain hospitals in two different cities should be run by local medical staff who worked in Wuhan during the first outbreak. It recommended these hospitals be vacated of all patients not infected with the virus. It says a quarantine area in an isolated buffer zone should be set up for the treatment of infectious diseases. On April 30th, a region in northern China that includes Beijing lowered its epidemic emergency response level from 1 to 2. This means people in Beijing will no longer need to wear masks. Beijing's 12th graders started school again three days ago, but universities in Beijing are still closed with no dates for reopening. Before April 29th, Beijing had the strictest controls in China. Anyone arriving in the city needed to be quarantined for 14 days, unless they were coming from a low-risk area of China. One Chinese travel booking platform said flight bookings in and out of Beijing jumped more than 500 percent within an hour of the announcement. But international travel remains out of the question for most, considering the travel restrictions imposed by other countries. A five-day May Day holiday begins this Friday, the 1st of May. Chinese Ministry of Transport said it expected 117 million people to travel by road, rail or air during the holiday. But is the situation in Beijing really improving? Ten days ago, a district in Beijing was officially classified as high risk. It's the only area in China with the classification. As we reported on April 28th, internal documents obtained by NTD show that Beijing has started regulating five funeral homes. 24-7 workstations will now be set up in 21 state-owned hospitals. Many wonder if the move is the regime preparing for another outbreak. Another set of documents seen by NTD show a district in Beijing is now converting hotels into quarantine centers. Lockdowns are now lifted in most Chinese cities, but people are still very afraid. Many people don't trust the official figures and don't like going out to eat. A March survey of over 5,000 restaurants showed many are struggling to reopen due to high costs and weak demand. Over 90 percent of restaurants said their turnover had dropped by more than half compared to last year. 
A YouTube video from April 24th shows a shopping center in a southern coastal city. Before the epidemic, people were lining up outside its restaurants. Now, it's almost empty. One clothing store has 90% off some products. Still, nobody is coming. China's economy has been hard hit by the virus, but just how bad is it? According to a survey of 547 companies in China by data analysis company China Beige Book, by the end of April, 91 percent of Chinese companies had resumed work. But over two-fifths were unable to operate at more than 50 percent capacity. Only 4 percent were operating at full capacity. Thousands of Americans are suing the Chinese regime for damages caused by the virus outbreak. Florida-based Berman Law Group filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of American healthcare workers infected with the virus. Filed on Wednesday, April 8th, the lawsuit seeks damages from the Chinese regime for allegedly hoarding medical equipment and for denying exports of PPE to America, endangering the lives of frontline medical staff and first responders. This follows a March 12th lawsuit by the same group, alleging the Chinese regime knew about the dangers of the virus but chose to hide it for economic gains. At the time, the lawsuit only included four Americans and a baseball training center. Now thousands have joined. A human rights activist jailed, his mom now critically ill. She wants to see him one last time but has been denied. NTD's Juliet Song reports. Her lung cancer getting worse, breathing getting harder by the day. This mother in China wrote an open letter, hoping to see her son one last time. After I pass away, I hope people can help and pay more attention to my son. He's innocent. He's innocent. Her son Huang Qi is one of the most famous human rights activists in China. He founded China's first human rights news website. It's named after the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Huang is active in exposing human rights abuses and government corruption. He also helped the families of those who died in the massacre seek compensation. Huang's efforts have earned him international accolades including two awards from Reporters Without Borders. Last year, Chinese authorities sentenced him to 12 years in prison on the charge of, quote, illegally providing state secrets abroad and leaking state secrets. Huang suffers from coronary artery disease and uremia, but the prison has denied him proper medical care. His 87-year-old mother fears for his health. In her letter, she wrote, he won't last long with these health conditions. Also, there is little hope he will be released. We probably won't ever see one another again. She hasn't seen him for three years. Activists close to Huang's mother said she can't go unless the authorities approve. She said she doesn't know if he's alive or dead. She hasn't received any information from him. She sent a letter but doesn't know if he's received it. Huang Qing hasn't called her. Usually you're allowed to call your family a month after being imprisoned. Huang spent almost half of the last two decades in jail for his activism. But his mother still supports his work. She holds placards that say, Son, mom believes you're innocent. She keeps demanding he be released. Two years ago, she set out to appeal for Huang in Beijing, but was stopped halfway by the police. She is now under house arrest and can't seek medical help. She wants to be treated in a hospital, but she said she can't because the hospital won't take her. She's gravely ill. Her legs are all bloated. She wants to visit Huang Qin because she's worried about his health. To this day, Huang's mother is closely watched by authorities, and she's not allowed visitors. She's over 80 years old, yet still authorities are monitoring her. This is inhumane. These people, we want to visit her, but she's worried we will be implicated and suppressed by the authorities. Huang's mom fears she can't last until the day she will finally get to see her son. In a video seeking help two years ago, she shed tears for her son, saying she just wants to see him one last time. Xiong Bin and Juliet Song, NTD News. Canada's opposition leader recently said the country needs to rethink their relationship with China. So how are Canada-China relations and what's the significance during the pandemic?
In the early morning of October 8, 1970, as China's communist leader Mao Zedong learned that China and Canada were establishing diplomatic relations, he reportedly laughed and said, We now have a friend in America's backyard. In the decades that followed, Canada helped China secure a seat on the United Nations General Assembly and become a member of the World Trade Organization. It also gave tens of millions of dollars in aid to China and sold it nuclear reactors. Canada invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the Beijing-based Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, an institute launched by China to raise funds for its global expansion campaign, the Belt and Road Initiative. But as the virus broke out, China's Canadian friend was kept in the dark, just like every other country. In February, Canada's chief public health officer argued against blocking travel from China based on advice from the World Health Organization. She herself is a WHO advisor. The reason why the World Health Organization doesn't recommend something like this is that, um, in general, it may it may do more harm than good. China had posted the virus, you know, genome very fast. What are they getting out of it, right? So I think the idea is to support China. It's reasonable to believe global health officials like Tam were unaware of China's influence on the WHO at the beginning of the outbreak, although few would deny it now. Canadian physician and WHO advisor Bruce Alward repeatedly praised China's outbreak control, but refused to recognize Taiwan's efforts. Hello? We, 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 Sorry, I, can't hear, I couldn't hear your question. Okay, yeah, let me, let, let me, let me repeat the question. No, that's so, okay. Let, let's move to another one then. Right, because, because I'm, I'm actually curious on talking about Taiwan as well, on Taiwan's case. The WHO has blocked Taiwan from joining the organization under pressure from China. As of today, over 50,000 Canadians have been infected with the virus. Nearly 3,000 have died. Calls are now growing in Canada to rethink the country's relationship with the Chinese regime. Many, in fact, have been calling for the rethink since before the outbreak. We need uh, to have a reset in that relationship with the government of China. China's reaction to the arrest of Huawei CFO was the wake-up call. In December 2018, at the request of the United States, Canada arrested Meng Wangzhou. Meng is Huawei CFO and daughter of its founder, Ren Zhenfei, who is a former member of China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA. The U.S. charged Meng and Huawei with violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. NTD obtained group chat messages between former Huawei employees. One said he can prove that Huawei was selling sanctioned goods to Iran. The employee was later arrested by Chinese police. Right after Meng's arrest, China arrested two Canadian citizens, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, a former diplomat and a businessman. The incident was seen as retaliation for Meng's arrest. Meng is out on bail and living in her multi-million dollar Vancouver home. The two Canadians, however, are still jailed in China. Last Thursday marked 500 days since their detention. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he had been, quote, working extremely diligently on the issue. Chinese Communist Party does not believe in the rule of law. I mean, if your first reaction when you have a problem with Canada is you kidnap two senior Canadians. We can't, we can't work with a government like that. But some don't see it this way. After Meng's arrest, Canada's former foreign affairs minister, John Manley, criticized the Canadian government for arresting the Huawei CFO, saying they should have exercised a little bit of creative incompetence. According to Canadian public media CBC News, Manley sits on the board of TELUS, which, like most other Canadian telecommunications companies, has business relations with Huawei. Another of Meng's sympathizers is the former Canadian ambassador to China, John McCallum. Last January, he spoke in front of Chinese media, including state media CCTV and Xinhua, and listed out three arguments Meng can make before a judge to avoid extradition to the U.S. Critics say McCallum undermined the independence of Canada's judicial process by basically offering legal advice to Meng. A former ambassador to China called the comments mind-boggling. McCallum was eventually forced to resign by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. 
Canadian media The Globe and Mail reported that when McCallum was a member of parliament for the opposition Liberal Party, he began to travel extensively to China at the expense of Beijing-friendly groups. He took trips valued at $73,300 from China or pro-Beijing business groups. The whole story of John McCallum ought to be a warning to Canadian politicians and the Canadian government that they have to be very careful in how they deal with the Chinese Communist Party government in Beijing and the people who they appoint uh, to important positions in that relationship. Trips like these are commonly used by Beijing to develop relationships with politicians. The guests are often treated with lavish dinners and luxury hotels. They are also arranged to meet with Communist Party officials. In 2006, the then mayor of Vancouver, Sam Sullivan, told the Vancouver Sun, quote, When I go to China, they treat me like an emperor. After coming back from China, Sullivan pursued court action to shut down a long-running protest site outside the Chinese consulate in Vancouver. The site is run by practitioners of Falun Gong, a spiritual practice persecuted in China. In its 2019 annual report, Canada's Parliamentary Security and Intelligence Committee included a quote that read, With deep coffers and the help of Western enablers, the Chinese Communist Party uses money rather than communist ideology as a powerful source of influence, creating parasitic relationships of long-term dependence. The regime started to take actions that surprised even longtime Canadian friends. The same week China arrested the two Michaels, Margaret McQuaig Johnston, a former Canadian official and China affairs expert, discovered her locked suitcase had been searched in her Shanghai hotel room. This despite the fact that she had worked for decades to help China build up its economic institutes. McQuaig Johnston was also told by a Chinese national that the CCP has a list of 100 Canadians it could pick up at any time. Canadian media The Star reported that after going back to Canada, McQuaig Johnston started to challenge the regime's abusive behaviors. She was one of only a few longtime friends of China to do so. She encouraged Canada to pull out of the Beijing-centered Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and to use Magnitsky legislation to punish Hong Kong officials who abuse human rights. She also urged the country to pay more attention to China's actions in the Indo-Pacific and she's not alone. Last November, a veteran Chinese-Canadian politician, Richard Lee, came forward and revealed that in 2015, he was detained for eight hours in Shanghai. He was forced to hand over his phone and passcode. Chinese authorities then reviewed confidential government information stored on it. Lee said he was targeted by the CCP for joining the commemoration of the Tiananmen Square massacre in front of Vancouver's Chinese embassy every June 4th. Lee kept silent for years. He said he didn't want to cause troubles for the Canada-China relationship. But the Chinese regime's growing infiltration into Canadian politics compelled him to speak out. In a recent interview with American thought leaders, J. Michael Cole, a China scholar and senior fellow with Canada's McDonald Laurier Institute, said that the COVID-19 outbreak should serve as a moment of reckoning for democracies like Canada. He said countries need leadership who are more willing to challenge China. Uh, that probably signifies a bit more confrontation. There's going to be costs. Uh, but the problem is that, especially countries like Canada, we never tested the waters. The moment Beijing threatens something or expresses displeasure, we back away, we back off, and Beijing gets gets what it wants. Uh, but uh, leaders oftentimes forget, especially countries like Canada, China needs our natural resources. China wants access to certain technologies that its own people still cannot produce. So it needs us at least as much as we need it. So that should give us the ability to push back on on fundamentals and values that are dear to us. Normal life seems to be right around the corner for many Americans. Stay-at-home orders expiring in a number of states and Macy's announcing they're opening nearly 100 stores on Monday. Nearly 63,000 Americans have passed away from the CCP virus, but the recoveries are more than double that, 150,000. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more updates. Macy's will be back in business Monday, opening 68 stores in five southern states. 
where retail businesses are allowed to reopen their doors. Included are Georgia, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. And in Alabama, the stay-at-home order expires today. Some businesses can reopen, but others like gyms and restaurants will have to wait. Alabama is one of four other states planning to open colleges and universities in the fall. No doubt the CCP virus pandemic has caused financial hardships for states. In Tennessee, Nashville mayor proposing a 32 percent increase on property taxes, saying his goal is to avoid laying off city employees. And Michigan's governor thinking about how to support essential workers. The state governor proposing free college for frontline workers. The state stay-at-home order is still set to expire on May 15th. That's after five Michigan businesses tried to sue the governor for the extension, but the lawsuit failed. On the other hand, California's governor proposed to close beaches, but he was turned down by city council officials. We're still by no stretch of the imagination out of the woods there. It's just stable. We're not seeing substantial declines. Reports say that now he may order them to close anyway. Likewise, other state governors are saying their tight restrictions are still needed, Nevada and Washington being the latest to extend their stay-at-home orders. Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And today, essentially rejecting theories of a man-made origin. The U.S. intelligence community said it agrees the CCP virus was not genetically modified or man-made. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the update. On Thursday, the U.S. intelligence community said it agrees that the CCP virus was not man-made. The office did not explain how it came to that conclusion. And at a press conference, President Trump said he hadn't seen the statement, but did see evidence suggesting the virus came from the lab. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So the possibility that the virus leaked from the laboratory in Wuhan is still being looked into. Just yesterday, Pompeo said China still hasn't given the U.S. access to the lab. Look, we still haven't gained access. The world hasn't gained access to the WIV, the Virology Institute there. We, we don't know precisely where this virus originated from. The intelligence community also said it's looking into whether the outbreak began through contact with infected animals. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Millions more Americans filed claims for unemployment benefits last week. New data shows the economy suffered its sharpest contraction since the Great Recession in the first quarter of this year. New unemployment claims continue to rise in the U.S., but at a slower rate than previous weeks. 3.8 million signed on for unemployment in the third week of April. That's down from 4.4 million in the second week and a record 6.8 million in the last week of March. It brings new jobless claims for the last six weeks to 30 million. That's nearly one in five American workers. GDP also shrunk by almost 5% in the first three months of the year. The second quarter may be even worse, but the Federal Reserve says things should improve after that as lockdowns are lifted and the virus is hopefully brought under control. Amazon's stock market value jumps during the CCP virus pandemic. Only several companies apply for loans aimed at Pentagon suppliers and more in business news. No company's stock market value has benefited more from the virus pandemic than Amazon's. The company's market capitalization has ballooned by over $90 billion, reaching record highs since mid-February. The jump adds $5 billion to Chief Executive Jeff Bezos' fortune. Fewer than 20 companies are considering applying for $17 billion worth of loans earmarked as relief funds for Pentagon suppliers hit by the pandemic. The Pentagon has been working to shore up finances among defense contractors. The Pentagon's chief weapons buyer says the money comes with strings attached that might not appeal to public companies. Google says its Meet teleconferencing software will become available over the next few weeks for free. Anyone with an email address can use it, even if it's not a Gmail account. Meet was previously only available to users of its G Suite productivity tools, which are commonly used by larger companies in schools. PayPal is waiving its fee for customers who want to cash their government stimulus checks. The move lets people cash the checks while staying at home, avoiding a trip to the bank during lockdown. PayPal will waive the fee until May 31st. Customers have to take photos of the front and back of the checks through the PayPal app to access the cash. 
Basketball fans are on the edge of their seats now that NBA executives and player agents are calling on the league to cancel the remainder of the season. They're worried about the spread of the CCP virus. Even as some states begin easing restrictions, cracks are beginning to show in the NBA's resolve. Team owners are concerned about liability issues. Despite the reservations, the NBA has given every indication it plans to complete the current season. The league announced it would soon unveil rule changes. The changes would allow teams to open their practice facilities, where players can partake in treatment and limited workouts. The NBA was the first league to suspend play after a Utah Jazz player tested positive. Georgia's decision to allow businesses like tattoo parlors and nail salons to reopen has drawn criticism from all corners. How will Georgians take precautions? Here's how one massage therapist is trying to do it safely. In a field like massage therapy, it can be tough to maintain social distancing. But from the waiting area to the massage room, they're trying to stay safe. Good hygiene like washing hands, temperature scans, um, everything's getting clean between each person. Uh, so we're taking a lot of precautions. Business owner Dr. Gardner says they're doing their best, even requiring clients to answer questions about possible virus exposure. Before you sign your name in, in the sign-in form, I have you, we have you read this, and if there's a yes to any of this, then we'll tell you to go to your doctor and uh, reschedule your appointment for today. The clinic includes two parts, chiropractic and massage therapy. The chiropractic side remained open, while the massage therapy side closed for three weeks. But the lockdown still took a toll on the business. When we had to close the massage therapist down, when she couldn't work, it really hurt us quite a bit. Um, a lot of patients as well, they don't want to leave their home because of the virus, which is very understandable. Business has slowed, but since opening, Chandler says she's a bit busier than she thought. I really didn't expect a lot of people to call, but I did have more than I expected. With fewer chairs in the waiting room, temperature checks, and more cleaning than usual, they're ready to buckle down and get business going. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. New York City subways are overwhelmed with homeless sleeping on trains. This, as the city's transit system, is reserved for essential workers during the virus pandemic. 8507. New York City officials are wondering what to do about the city's large homeless population. While many residents are staying home, homeless people are seeking shelter in the train system. Transit employees film their daily environment to raise awareness about the dangers they face. Workers are worried about their health. Those who need to ride the trains are worried about their safety. Crime on trains has gone up as ridership has gone down. Right now, trains are supposed to stay in service for essential workers only. The governor, the mayor, city transit officials and homeless advocates are at odds over how to solve the problem. They're also concerned about CCP virus spread among the homeless. The Metro Transit Authority's interim head said police are supposed to stop people from spreading out in cars or sleeping, but admits enforcement is weak. The train problem also creates obstacles for how the city will eventually reopen. Uh, everyone is talking about reopening. I get it. You can't sustain being closed. The economy can't sustain it. Individual families can't sustain it. We can't sustain it on a personal level. Our children can't sustain it. Even as the city's virus infection rate gradually grows less severe, there is worry that the densely populated transit system could aggravate the remaining virus situation. Normally, people are too close to properly social distance while riding, and the city has yet to find a solution to its long-standing homeless situation. And Russia's prime minister says he is infected with the virus. He acted as the country's main coordinator in response to the outbreak. Russia's Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin confirmed in a video conference with President Putin that he was diagnosed with the virus. He said he will temporarily step down to recover. Putin wished him a quick recovery and appointed an interim prime minister for the time being. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson appeared on TV for the first time after recovering from the virus. He said the UK has passed the peak of the outbreak and promised to announce a lockdown exit strategy next week. His remarks come just one day after his fiance gave birth to their child. German Chancellor Angela Merkel announced that playgrounds, museums and churches in Germany can reopen. She added that more measures to ease the lockdown will be announced soon, but social distancing rules must stay in place. In a South African city, thousands of people were seen lining up for food bundles amid lockdown on Wednesday. Drone footage showed thousands waiting in a line that stretched for two and a half miles. 
And on a positive note, South Korea today reported no new domestic virus cases for the first time since its peak on February 29th. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.